that was done out of Harvard with taking individuals who are in a long-term care home and they gave each person a plant and yeah. to each to half of them they said this is your plant but don't worry about it yeah. the nurse will take care of it to the other half they said this is your plant but you need to take care of it whether it lives or dies is on you and they came back uh, six months later and they found that voluntary attendance at a weekly movie was twice as high for the plant active group They also found in the medical psychological records of those people in the active plant group were all better uh, than than the people who had plant passive. But the most amazing thing was that uh, the turnover, which is what long-term care facilities call death rate, uh, the turnover among people in the active plant group was half that of the people in the passive plant group. So just having a plant, giving a person a sense of purpose, a sense of direction, commitment, loving, taking care of a plant had such a profound impact, I think is astounding if you think about the kinds of choices we make day in and day out, either live or not. And that's what we're restoring to people. That's what your work has done for your patients, is you're restoring a sense of hope, direction, meaning, and purpose in their life. Oh, yeah, that was another one. You're giving people false hope. I said, that's an oxymoron. You can't have false hope. You know, I always say it's like buying a lottery ticket. Some people win. But, but you know, when people don't agree with you, you go nuts. Uh, they always have to come up with terminology that makes you look silly. Now I got one more question for you. Because one of our sons, he's not a doctor, but, oh, boy, does he know medicine and research and all kinds of things. So he's read your book, too. Do you think that there are going to be people who use the genes as an excuse? They, you're, you have an illness. Yeah, I got terrible genes. You know, don't blame me, or I don't want to do anything. It's my genes. Uh, I'm not saying he's doing that. I mean, he's always trying to change everything. But do you think some people will use it as an excuse? Oh, unequivocally. I mean, that's the case now. Uh, yeah. If someone is overweight, um, if someone has developed heart disease or cancer or irritable bowel and uh, they get a genetic test and it says, well, you've got a 40% likelihood of getting irritable bowel or you know, whatever the percentage is, and they say, oh, well, I can't help it. It's my genes. Well, you know, that's not a realistic interpretation because what it means is that everyone else with the same 40% likelihood there are 60% of them that did not develop that disease. So a person can blame their genetics. Now, there are genetically caused diseases. They're called monogenic or fully penetrant diseases that, again, show up in the first six to eight months of life. So neurological disorders, ALS and such, are clearly neurologically or, I'm sorry, genetically predisposed diseases. There's very little that we can do to change that. We can even as adults maybe decelerate or alter the trajectory of that disease. But the point is is that 95% of what we experience as a risk factor, as a disease, how long we will live, is dependent on everything that we do. And, And there was one study, I was actually going to refer to this before the break, uh, it was done after the book was published. I didn't get a chance to include it, but uh, Ancestry.com uh, worked with a group at the Calico Life Sciences Group, and it's a genetic research group. They, they pooled all of the uh, Ancestry data into a data pool of 400 million people, 400 million wow. Well, most studies, you know, have 100 people or a few thousand people. This is 400 million. And what they did is they looked at the life expectancy of the grandparent, the parent, and the person reporting their ancestry. Uh, and they wanted to see, did, in fact, the life expectancy of the previous generations predict how long the person would live, as opposed to what they called assortive mating, which was their term for the psychosocial factors like uh, wealth height, education, factors other than the gene, did that predict more accurately life expectancy? Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the genetic 
side the lineage genetically did not predict subsequent life expectancy of the person who submitted their data to ancestry the uh, epi- uh, the uh, psychosocial factors all predicted about 94 95% of life expectancy so it just underscores how we may have a genetic predisposition to a certain life expectancy but what we do then governs whether that's going to be manifest or not and uh, you know life expectancy is one of those things that everyone assumes oh well it's just my genes the point is it's not it's us well let me boy uh, you're reminding me i forgot one of our grandchildren he's the only survivor i mean the first one in a disease called carboxylase pyruvate deficiency yeah that these infants are born with this ability to break down fat into sugar. And you don't know that from an infant, and all these kids can't metabolize and die. But somehow we got him to survive. And uh, now helping people all over the world. Uh, you know, it's like our daughter's a specialist. You know, when parents call her, she tells them how, yeah, even at the hospital, she's telling the medical staff how to take care of him because she knows him better than they do, you know, not just numbers. But it just shows you that it's possible, you know, that when we know what the genetic problem is and we can help the body uh, and sustain it, survival is a possibility. Uh, Absolutely. And, you know, the other thing is that, yeah, yeah. And the other thing is that there's so many other studies that are supporting, uh, you know, what both of you have been bringing, you know, into the medical profession. And that is, for example, a Harvard study that was trying to figure out, uh, you know, the longevity, you know, how people survived would would not have a heart attack. And they they finally found out that the leading factor in survivability and health was your family and friends, you know, how you associated with yeah. others. So, so there is a, is a gigantic uh, opening for health, immune, immunity, uh, a longer life. And, you know, doctors aren't trained to incorporate that. And, and, you know, that's why I think the Happiness Club has done so well, and we have over a 1,000 around in the world, because that we need to interconnect. We need to physically meet one another uh, share good ideas, share our feelings, support one another. In looking for happiness for ourselves, we end up giving it to others. So there's nothing that can extend our life more, I feel, than the happiness uh, that we're now entitled to. We need to give it to ourselves and, and understand that it's part of our well-being. Another crazy question. Do you think your genes have anything to do with the occupation you choose for your life i know there are a lot of psychological factors involved but do you think there's anything involved genetically that's an interesting question and uh i don't know um i don't know what the what the research literature or any literature for that matter uh says about that i mean i since genetic influences on cognition uh intelligence you know, spatial ability, uh, IQ is, is clearly, you know, a push in a particular direction. I would suspect that early life exposure, like maybe uh, being exposed to a family doctor who is an influence or having an illness in your family or, you know, the wounded healer, the person who recovers from a, a, an illness like Norman Cousins and, in fact, then seeks out a way to help others. I think there certainly are very strong psychosocial factors that would express the genetic predisposition to a certain kind of intelligence, uh, analytic ability, mathematical and science ability uh, to move in a, uh, the direction of uh, medicine or healthcare or really any profession for that matter. But again, I think it's this complex interaction between a genetic push and what, in fact, we make of it by way of our environment and, and training and, and thought process. Well, where do you see consciousness fitting in? Oh, <laughs> well, well, I think I mean, I bring this up. This is a lot of personal things I've experienced. I mean, I always say my life should be a movie. I almost you know, I had a near-death experience at age four, choking on a toy. At that time, it wasn't something people talked about or knew, so... It just happened. And a friend of mine over the telephone one day said to me, why are you living this life? And I went into a trance (laughs) through the phone call. 
But you wonder, again, is this affecting and relating to our, you know, telomeres, uh, to our genes? I, I just wonder where you would go with that. Well, at ground level, um, it is all about consciousness. Um, and consciousness is the quality that is in ourselves, which is interconnected with the universe and with all other people. I mean, we can call it by many names, Atman, God, Brahma, whatever, Buddha. Um, it has many, many different names, but the point is it's that sense of who we are, uh, a sense of being in the universe. Um, when I, I wrote a book uh, a number of years ago called Sound, Sound Mind, Sound Body, and I wanted to try to define health, and I wanted to try to get at the role of consciousness. And my two, I interviewed a number of individuals, and one of them was Stephen Hawking, who represented yeah. yep. a sound mind in a, in a very uh, compromised body. The other was Bruce Jenner, right after he had won the Olympic decathlon, and he said, well, I'm not the brightest bulb, and that was by his own description, <laughs> but I've trained my body through doing visualization. And whatever definition of health that I came up with in the course of the book, I knew it had to encompass both extremes. And at the end of the book, the best that I could come up with was a life fully and well expressed. In both cases, wow. it fits. In, both ca in all the other instances of people I interviewed in the course of the book, it really, it really fit. And so the role of consciousness in the epigenetic revolution is that it establishes the preeminence of choice, the Beautiful. expression of consciousness in what we choose day in and day out to think, to eat, to do, to be, uh, is what it's all about. Mm. Great, great. Let's hold that thought, and we will be right back because we're in the middle of some interesting information. Join Dr. Bernie Siegel on Mind Health Matters every week, Wednesday through Friday, 12 p.m. and 12 a.m. Eastern Time on Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. Bernie will draw from his inspirational personal journey, offering us special nuggets of his sacred wisdom. Listen in as Bernie reminds us to be fully engaged in life. Dr. Bernie Siegel's writings and the 12 books he's published so far reflect his passion to reach people struggling with all of life's challenges. His latest, A Book of Miracles, inspiring true stories of healing, gratitude, and love, is both riveting and belief-expanding. Bernie has produced wonderful resources for everyone, like 365 Prescriptions for the Soul, Daily Messages of Inspiration, Hope, and Love, and Faith, Hope, and Healing. Bernie's books also include those like Love, Magic, and Mud Pies, a great resource for parents, and delightful loving stories like Buddy's Candle to help children of all ages cope with the loss of a loved one, be it a pet or a parent. To purchase Bernie's books, CDs, or DVDs, go to BernieSiegelMD.com. And while you're there, empower the mind, body, and spirit with Bernie's heartwarming articles. Ever wonder what it's like to have your own radio show? Well, wonder no longer, because you can dip into the radio airwaves by being host for the day on syndicated Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. It's a fabulous way to get your radio feet wet. It's an opportunity to market your business, modality, or book. Have a guest, mention a sponsor, and take callers. Or you may want to facilitate a lesson by going solo. It's up to you. Listeners can be online, mobile, in cars with Bluetooth, or listen through Amazon's Echo by asking, Alexa, play Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. For more details, go to DreamVision7Radio.com and click on Host for the Day. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life 
flow. Okay, we are back, and Ken, that was a beautiful description. I, I, I'm getting that interconnectedness is a part of consciousness, and I think, <clears throat> tell me what you think of this short theory, that ultimately, you know, interconnectedness is the way we're all going because we are interconnected, whether we realize it or not, at whatever level we realize it. 